Welcome to the underground, the Steel City Underground, a Pittsburgh Steelers podcast made by fans like you, for fans like you. Now, here's your host, Joe Kuzma. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of the Steel City Underground podcast. I am your host, Joe Kuzma, and I hope that each and every one of you listen who partake in the Easter holiday weekend. I hope you had a good one. Weather was certainly a lot better than the craziness that we've been having over the last few weeks. And it finally looks like spring is here. And when spring is here, all I can think about is the draft is right around the corner. With all of the news with Dan Rooney's passing and some of the events that were going on over the weekend, I got a little little off track with where I wanted to end and settle the quarterback and the draft situation with the Pittsburgh Steelers. I'm sure I sound like a broken record. I realize it. I am really, I'm like almost blue in the face from talking about it with fans, whether it be on social media, whether it be with even Brian or any other guest who jumps on the show here. So I just wanted to complete this thought real quick before I get into some of the draft needs and some of the makeup and composition of the current Pittsburgh Steelers roster and just some of the operational things that Kevin Colbert and Mike Tomlin have done with their time together, and even more so Kevin Colbert since he's been in his position a little longer. Um, Look, folks, uh, I think that myself and Brian would be in agreement here in saying it's not necessarily – we don't think this is the strongest quarterback class, so to speak. Now, we don't know. We obviously don't know, but the odds, no matter how great the quarterback class, the odds are always against a quarterback coming out and doing well and being a star in this league. And it gets even worse as you wait longer and longer to draft one. And everybody seems to think there is the Dak Prescott. I guess it's the Dak Prescott effect, as I've been calling it, or the Russell Wilson deal, or just the fact that Tom Brady came out of the sixth round. You've heard me say time and time again, these guys were not meant to be the starters for those teams. Prescott last year had Tony Romo in front of him. He got hurt. He had, uh, what was it, uh, Kellen Moore? Yeah, Kellen Moore, I think, uh, who they just re-signed, actually, to be a backup to Prescott now that Tony Romo is going to head into broadcasting. Um, look, he had two guys in front of him. They kind of just – it just he just fell into place with that. Drew Bledsoe gets hurt. Tom Brady goes in. The Seahawks themselves, they signed Matt Flynn to like this huge deal. I think it was like a five-year deal or something uh, based on one good game with the Green Bay Packers, and you see how it happened with Matt Flynn. And just – Turns out that the Seahawks got lucky that Russell Wilson was good. I mean, it could have totally been backwards. So outside of that, there's been guys, there's Ryan Fitzpatrick, there's been Matt Schaub. Um, I think that's everybody. I think that's the other two that were listed, I think, with Bob Labriola, Eric Herman, and myself, between all of these different things that we've compiled. We've even shown, and it was it was backed up, somebody dug something up to Bill Polian, former general manager for several teams, uh, and a Hall of Famer in his own right. Um, and, and Polian said back in 2013 that Landry Jones could be the best quarterback of that 2013 class, and guess what? He was probably right. And as much as it makes you cringe or want to, uh, kick a baby or a puppy or whatever because you don't like Landry Jones. It just goes to show you, hey, look, I'm not saying Landry Jones is the second coming. I'm not saying he walks on water, and I'm not saying he's Ben Roethlisberger's replacement. If you've heard us before, you'll hear it again. He is a backup and nothing more than a backup. But if he was the best in that class, which I feel he was, there was really nobody else in that class that was worth a flip that has shown anything over the last four years. It just goes to show you how tough the position is. So if the Steelers end up going quarterback, this is what I have to say. Not in the first round, please, and probably not in the second round. And if you're going past that, you are really rolling the dice. I think you're rolling the dice to begin with. I think there are definitely more pressing needs. We have talked about this before. We would like an edge rusher or a cornerback. I know a lot of people want a safety. Look, uh, Mike Mitchell... Still going to be around for another couple years. He's under contract. You've got him this season and next season. You want to start grooming the next guy? Maybe. If that's the direction you think you're headed, maybe. You have Sean Davis. You're pretty much locked down there. I have no problem with the depth 
type situation. There's the money backer thing that's going around. That would be like a chess piece you could put out there that does that can cover as well as maybe pass rush. It's a larger defensive back with some speed. It's almost something like a lot of people would think with moving Ryan Shazier to safety, which is never going to happen, by the way. So a lot of people are looking at a player like Obi Melanafu. Look, it can happen. Okay, I'm not saying it's not going to happen. I don't. I. I hey, I'm not inside those top secret meetings, nor is anyone else. We're taking an educated guess at this. I'm just going to educate guess this that there aren't any quarterbacks that I want for sure with pick 30 overall. And in fact, as I pointed out, I think that other teams let the other teams make that mistake. And if other teams really want a quarterback. Maybe Pittsburgh gets a little bit more compensation out of it, as I pointed out with all the formulas and values. And that's where I really wanted to head before I had to cut that short and got a little long-winded and had the extra tribute to one of, I like to call people Mr. Steeler. There's a few of them, of course, with the Rooney family. And then, of course, uh, we were talking to the author, um, uh, John Finkel, with the true Mr. Steeler on the field, Mean Joe Green, and that autobiography. But... Definitely all of that was uh, well served, had to be said. Now, if you're going into the third round, fourth round, looking at a quarterback, I know a few of us internally here like Joshua Dobbs, uh, a guy who's like in a, an aerospace engineering student. That's his major. It just goes to show you he's got plans for life after football. He's a, like literal rocket scientist. I mean, now there's – Not only a smart player, but also one that's athletic might translate on the field. But I'm still trying to tell you, you start going into the third, fourth, fifth round and you take a quarterback, you're taking another Landry Jones. You're taking a chance, a very, 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 very distant chance. It's like hitting the lottery that they end up somewhat better. And we still don't know that Dak Prescott's going to be any good in his sophomore season and going forward. Now, Russell Wilson's been all right. I'd say Tom Brady's had a great career. There's a few other exceptions. Kurt Warner went completely undrafted. Everybody screwed up on that. In fact, everybody screwed up on Tom Brady, too. They all had to pass. What was he, sixth rounder? It's like Antonio Brown. means every team had to pass on him, not just once, twice, thrice. I don't know what you call that, four times. That's probably the easiest way to say it, five times. And then some six, and maybe even more if they have multiple picks in multiple rounds. So if they go third or beyond I'm not saying they're not going to take a quarterback. They've looked at three. They've had three in for pre-draft visits. Dobbs was one. Um, Patrick Mayhomes, probably the only guy I feel that might be worth a first-rounder. He, I don't see him following the 30, though. I think he's going to go pretty early. I think if the Cleveland Browns don't take Miles Garrett number one overall and they take Mitch Trubisky, let them do that. I mean, let them be the ones to make that mistake. If it works out for them, great. If not, typical Cleveland. That's what I'm trying to say. And there's a few others. Deshaun Kaiser, we have no interest in. And et cetera, et cetera. In fact, I'm trying to remember who the third guy was. I almost wanted to say it was Brad Kaya, who I'm not exactly from Miami, Florida. Not exactly super excited over him either. But these are just the things you you have to think about. I mean, the Steelers, they need guys on the outside. Uh, as much as we would like, James Harrison, not going to play forever. You need another outside linebacker. Perhaps the team could double dip, which they've been known to do before. It has happened many times, and Eric Herman actually wrote about this in a recent article, and I'm going to drill down through that here in a second. As soon as I get this other quarterback name up, let me tell you, the Internet is just dragging. It must be the Easter effect. Everybody's Netflixing and chilling (laughs) over the holiday weekend. Oh, Nate Peterman, who was uh, a local visit, of course, with Pittsburgh. Duh. Now, Nate Peterman, that's a late round. I mean, these are what they call developmental guys. It's because it's not somebody you're just going to have step on the field. I don't think the NFL is a place for – there's several positions that are very difficult to get anybody on the field, and the Steelers know this quite well. When they hold guys back, they've done it. Uh, they've eased in Bud Dupree as a rookie. They've eased in Martavis Bryant originally. Very few guys on the defense ever start as a rookie. Javon Hargrave, the first guy in like 20-some years last season. Uh, even Artie Burns doesn't start till week six against the Miami Dolphins officially start. And then he got quite a bit of decent playing time. And I also think they would have probably sat Sean Davis if things had worked out differently with maybe Senquez Golson getting hurt last season. So... The Steelers, their needs. What are their needs? We've talked about this before. 
I think definitely they can go with help in the secondary. Uh, they take two corners. I don't know that they take two corners. I think Cody Sensabaugh coming in definitely helps. But Will Gay, also a player you have to think about replacing in the future. It's just a matter of fact. It's nothing against Will Gay. We saw maybe a little bit of decline, and maybe that was just on count of changing positions and playing alongside rookies, et cetera, et cetera. Some things we don't know players' assignments. Sometimes guys get blamed for things that aren't their fault. You ever see well, – most people don't blame Ben Roethlisberger, but you ever see where they do, oh, he overthrew somebody. Well, maybe the wide receiver ran the wrong route. Or maybe they blame the wide receiver instead of Big Ben, and he's the one who threw wrong. I mean, people aren't on the same page all the time, and it happens on defense too. They don't cover, they don't, they don't shift, they don't pick up the right guy. Uh, there's all kinds of things that happen. There's a lot of moving parts. You got 11 guys on one side of the field, and they all have to be on the same page. And that's exactly that's that's the hope. That really is the hope. And you're going to see the Steelers are still going to try and repair some of this. They've been heavy on defense over the last few seasons. Of course, they took uh, three players on the defense with their first three picks last draft, and I think this draft you could expect much of the same. Most of us are projecting that they take at least two edge guys. Uh, looking at the outside linebackers in this depth chart, like I said, James Harrison, he may have just turned 39. I know he's got a birthday coming up here. Maybe it's in May. Uh, but he's not going to play forever. It's amazing he's played this long, to be honest, and as well as he's played. Bud Dupree is the real deal. He'll be around. Jarvis Jones is gone. Arthur Motes has a year left on his contract. Anthony Ciccolo, I think, is in similar territory. The deal with Ciccolo and a few others is when you don't make the roster initially as a rookie, you're technically re released and re-signed to the practice squad, which nullifies the original contract. So some of these guys are signed to different deals. They're not under like a four-year rookie deal that, let's say, Javon Hargrave or Sean Davis is under. And, of course, we talked about the fifth-round option with your first-round draft choices too. So those guys, you could uh, have them for four years and then tack on an extra year for some additional money, but maybe not as much as if you were to allow them to bump into free agency. So you're kind of seeing that actually. Actually, Le Le'Veon Bell is a perfect example of four years, no fifth-year option, have to franchise tag him, going to owe him a lot of money. But Anthony Ciccolo is one of these guys. They're kind of in limbo. I think he's got a year, two years left on his contract. You know, uh, I'm trying to think who else is, is still there. I mean, uh, there's not a lot. Uh, the cupboard is a little bare. This is a defense in a system that is predicated on linebacker play, and we have seen the Steelers go heavy on this before. We don't know if Will Gay is still going to be up to playing. You got Ross Cockrell, who is a tendered, restricted free agent, more than likely going to return, but still uh, up in the air at this point. Think he'll be back though. It was a low tender. It was only like fourth round, which is what he entered the league as with the Buffalo Bills. And if he does stick around this year, he may not be back next year. So that's why Sensel Boss signed to a two year deal at least. Don't know Senquiz Golson. Of course, the little bit of uh, hubbub over the gun deal down in Alabama, which of course I guess didn't necessarily break the law. That's why he wasn't charged, but uh, I don't know exactly what the whole thing is. I don't like to get into speculation. It, if, of course, who broke the news? TMZ. So there you go. We'll just leave it at that. It's, it was a TMZ thing. I don't see really any discipline or anything over that. But you gotta think a little. You gotta be a little bit smarter when you're in the public eye. Hey, look. You know what? I'm not anti-gun, and I am not gun ho over here. But I am gun friendly, and knowing how to safely. Hold and uh, hold a firearm, shoot a firearm, possess a firearm, when and where and how to carry and every other thing that there is. And there's different laws in different states. If you own a firearm, you've got to know better. And that's just it's it's a personal responsibility thing the same way I say it with anybody who's doing PEDs or smoking marijuana or anything like that. Just take care of your own business and just don't make headlines don't make noise especially since you haven't you haven't stepped foot on a field and played a snap yet you're expendable you've you've been expendable technically now you're very expendable especially if the Steelers double dip so let's talk about some of these double dips uh we went two years ago the Steelers Senquez Golson and this is what got me off track, by the way. And they also took in the fourth round Durant Grant from Ohio State. And neither one of those has worked out right now. Of course, Grant no longer on the roster at all. He got cut last year. He had an easy 
pick six in the first preseason game and kind of looked like things were going to turn around, but he never initially made the roster. So that one didn't really work for the Steelers, and you could see why they double dip. Here's the reason. Number two, Ryan Shazier, 2014. So they go with two linebackers, uh, Jordan Zumwalt. And, and there was some talk whether or not Zumwalt was going to convert to be outside or uh, play inside, but Zumwalt was always hurt. Uh, they actually gave, He actually got his first crack to try and make this roster during the 2016 preseason, even though he was drafted in 2014. And it just didn't, his health didn't work out for him. So you may see the same thing with Senquez Golson, to be completely honest. But Zumwalt, not a whole lot uh, on the line there. Uh, sixth or seventh round draft choice. So he was taken late 2013. And it's like every draft for like uh, almost all of Mike Tomlin's tenure, they've they've went double on positions they felt they've needed or liked. Uh, Marcus Wheaton and Justin Brown. In 2013, of course, Wheaton now gone, signed with the Chicago Bears, but was a solid player for his time here. Won't say yay or nay on that, but of course, he's definitely with a loaded wide receiver roster. He had an uphill battle after following that injury last year to even come back this season. He would have been fighting for playing time last year, in my opinion. Justin Brown had an opportunity to play because Lance Moore kind of he got signed and just uh, wasn't healthy and JB was just not very strong at blocking I guess he had run some bad routes and I, I, there was something else like a easy drop or something something that ultimately doomed him but he was a sixth round draft pick as well and he got canned and uh, released and uh, the Buffalo Bills had had him uh, last check and now he's I believe out of the league but then again you know what? Like I said, like I'm always saying, these late round picks, if they work out for you, great. If they don't, well, they don't. Uh, that's just the, that's just the nature of the business. I mean, the Steelers right now with eight draft picks, nine spots plus the one that will be Martavis Bryant, so technically ten spots on the roster that are available. You can't sign everybody. Like I, I always, I go crazy like looking at like the Cleveland Browns draft having ten, eleven, twelve draft picks every year. It just it's so much turnover. I mean, you end up with fifty three at the end. I mean, that's that's a large chunk. Uh, it's, it's think of a deck of cards. It's like an entire uh, entire suit. That's like just take all of the spades or all of the hearts. Those all new players. That's that's a that's a big deal. Uh, and, and you just can't do that. It just doesn't work that way. Uh, 2012, they went to repair the offensive line. Mike Adams, second round. Kelvin Beecham, seventh round. Now, Beecham worked out fantastically. And then, of course, he got hurt. And, and they're kind of lucky. They were already kind of working toward their way of the future with Alejandro Villanueva. That worked out for them and worked out even more that Kelvin Beecham kind of afforded them an extra compensatory pick in the third round, no less, for this season and probably look for very similar. What a, now, here's another thing to consider with a lot of this. The compensatory picks are given to compensate for a loss in free agency, and it's more or less done so teams can remain competitive even if they lose a star player, i.e., in this case, Lawrence Timmons, in cases before uh, Kelvin Beecham, for example, and there's different values awarded or assigned or some type of magic formula. I don't believe it's public whatsoever. It's kind of like the Colonel's secret recipe. So what ends up happening is 32-1 for every team in the league. Not Now, not every team in the league gets an extra pick. They just give out 32 because there's 32 franchises. For example, the several teams have multiple picks that they got extra. Uh, I want to say the Denver Broncos were one of those recipients once again. I know they were before. I don't have the full list in front of me, but the Steelers, for example, get one because they lost Beecham. More than likely, you want to know why they're not so aggressive in free agency? If they go after Dante Hightower, well, they don't get a compensatory pick the following year for Lawrence Timmons, losing Lawrence Timmons, depending on how Lawrence Timmons plays or is valued with his contract, et cetera, and this formula uh, shakes out, it could be a pretty high compensatory pick to usually start in the third round. You get one in the third round, I think that's pretty amazing. I I, I absolutely love it. Um, is it the best or fair system? And now, especially since you could trade those picks, I don't know. That's kind of out of my control. Uh, it's meant to balance things out and and improve parity across the league. And I think it's 
A. You know, it's worked out for the Steelers most certainly with getting additional draft picks. So that's why they don't go gung-ho over in free agency just signing everyone on a whim. Not to mention they're not going to just totally wreck their salary cap and not be able to keep their own players that they do want to keep here in the near future, i.e. A.B. and Bell. So uh, going forward here, this isn't the first time that they've tried with the cornerbacks. Uh, 2011, Curtis Brown, Cortez Allen, neither of those ended up working out either, especially we know how Cortez Allen fell out. Just a shame for that young man. I mean, I, I don't know. It just something got in his head. It seemed like he was there to make the plays, never could. Phantom injuries or realistic injuries or a loss of love for the game or focus, I don't, I don't know what happened, but he just kind of like just fell off the map. And he got paid. So be it. 2010, Jason Worlds, Thaddeus Gibson, trying to do the edge rusher thing once again back then. Worlds, not bad during his time, but decided to walk away from football. I mean, hey, good for him. Tip of the cap. Uh, 2010, they went with two wide receivers as well, and this was the big one. Emmanuel Sanders and Antonio Brown. Can't go wrong with either one of those, and there's a sixth-round pick, of course, with Brown that did work out. And then 2009, Keenan Lewis, who ended up playing earlier than he may have been anticipated to, especially with the Steelers back then, with their the defense was still rock solid for several seasons just off of a Super Bowl. And Joe Burnett, uh, geez, Joe Burnett. When I when I looked at this, I had to go and say, man, I don't even remember Joe Burnett. But and that that's all you need to know about Joe Burnett. And unfortunately, Keenan Lewis not in the league anymore. But hey, he had several productive years there. He played, he played young. He played early, and the Steelers couldn't afford to keep him because of all the superstars they had. So basically, what we're trying to say is is that the Steelers will double dip. In this draft, the composition of their roster, half of it is made up of players who have been drafted by the Steelers. But I just wanted to reflect, maybe not so much on talking about Kevin Colbert and how he gets it more right than wrong. I'll save that for another episode. But within this same article, if you care to look it up on SteelCityUnderground.com, well, I have a chart that's listed here. Now, this came from the NFL Players Association, and their table here has years in the league versus round that a player has been selected in. And just to give you kind of an idea, if they're taken in round one, their odds of being on a roster uh, from that first year for a first round selection, 99.7%, so practically 100%. 93 and a half drops to 83 in year three, 77.4 in four and 71 in year five, usually year five or beyond. Some teams that scouted some of these first-round guys, we'll take Jarvis Jones, for example. Most of us feel that Jarvis Jones did not work out. Um, I'm being polite here because, like I said, I, I believe in being a professional and just not throwing a bunch of shade. Jarvis Jones just wasn't a fit for the Steelers, let's put it that way. But the Arizona Cardinals who signed him, they they looked at him, and it's not like the Cardinals don't like signing former Steelers. They, that's kind of their forte. But... Maybe they do find something. Maybe Jarvis Jones works out there. You never know. Maybe he's a different fit for different coaches, different schemes, different systems. Could happen. This is how the Steelers find a lot of guys. Ross Cockrell being one that uh, was released by the Bills, like I said earlier. They were looking at him in the draft. They had scouted him. They knew that he could be a fit. They end up bringing him in. Tyson uh, uh, Alu-Alu for the Jacksonville Jaguars. Uh, Top 10 pick, 10th, 11th. Several years ago, that wasn't a guy that was going to fall to the Steelers. And they'd done their due diligence, looked at him, somebody that they still like and somebody they still feel they could uh, do something with. And it didn't necessarily work out with the Jaguars there. Okay player, maybe. Above average. Superstar. Pro bowler. Nah, not really not really in that category as a first rounder. So a lot of that happens. These first round guys are going to stick around more because they have a little bit of that pedigree and everybody had their eyes on them versus as you start to get down into the second rounders, I mean, it almost falls off a cliff. Most teams are going to hold on to at least their second round pick through that four-year rookie contract if they have a four-year deal. And you're going to see the same happens with these year three and year four when you get into the third and not so much the fourth round, but... 96.8, 96, 83, 74, and then it drops off to 41 because if they just didn't work out, most teams aren't going to take it. It's almost like a coin flip as to whether or not somebody lasts five years in the league. Like I said, average career length, 3.3 years. Um, average career is about six years for a player who makes the club's opening day roster in their rookie season. So... 
uh, third round picks, 96%. So your first three, and then your fourth rounder, 91 that first year. Fifth rounders, 81% that first year, 70%, 58% for a seventh rounder. And that's a lot because you, a lot of teams are uh, acquiring extra late round picks via trades, via compensatory picks. And uh, there's just not enough roster spaces, okay? There's not enough spots for the amount of players that are coming into this league. Other veterans are going to take spots, et cetera, et cetera, as you whittle it down. But most teams only have maybe one uh, one first-round pick if they hadn't traded it away or require, uh, acquired one from a trade, one in the second round, and then you're going to get a couple maybe extras here and there, third, fourth, fifth rounds. So those numbers fluctuate. But as you get into year two, uh, those the fifth and sixth round guys are just barely above fifty percent, fifty six and fifty seven, and forty five percent for a seventh rounder. Whether they stick around more uh, for a second season, like I said, still in the high nineties for first and second rounders, seventy five percent third and fourth rounders. You could chop the rest of that down: eighty three percent first and second round, sixty two for a third rounder in their third year. And then a coin flip again, basically 54%. I know some of you are thinking, coin flips 50%. And if you've played poker, uh, Texas Hold'em, things like that, it's practically a coin flip, trust me. And then some of these get, and then the rest start to go 37 and 35 and 31. Year four was my 75%, basically. But then everything from the third round down just takes a, a landslide from 37 to 34 to 24 to 20 to 21. That's from the third round down to the seventh. 37, 34, 24, 20, and 21, and then you have even less, just take that in half. It literally gets cut in half for year five for those third rounders and below to 18, 17, 16, 10% for a sixth rounder, and then 16% for a seventh rounder. That one's that one just really blew my mind that um, the seventh rounders actually stick around longer in some cases than the sixth rounders do, and I think I think that a lot of that has to do with maybe contracts or uh, like look at Kelvin Beecham now he's a guy that just became a, an unfound like almost undrafted just diamond in the rough type player sixth round picks mm, don't know. Uh, but your first round guys are going to hang around about 71% of the time after they're in the league for five years. And the second rounders are less than a coin flip at roughly 42%. And they just, it's just, they're gone. These rosters change a lot from year to year. We saw that with the Steelers from 2015 to 2016. Hey, just think about it. Will Allen manning the backfield versus Sean Davis. Uh, Artie Burns out there on the playing corner. Uh, Ross Cockrell is a starter versus what Antoine Blake and you had William Gay as the regular starter there and then they were trying to use Brandon Boykin and they were trying to use anybody they could find to play that nickel slot in 2015 so a lot of turnover a lot of turnover there uh, you even see it uh, maybe not so much with the offense with the Steelers more recently but just think about all the running backs and stuff they went through until they got to uh, Lev Bell from from Bettis to Parker to who you went through like Mendenhall, Baron Batch, Isaac Redman, et cetera, et cetera. So one thing I want to leave you off with, we're talking edge rushers. We're talking cornerbacks. We're going to get really in depth with that. We're about a week and a half away from the draft. We have the draft war room. We are going to have some major exclusives over at steelcityunderground.com for the draft coming up within the next week and a half. We've got some just, I'd love to talk about it, but Hey, just keep an eye out because there's some really cool stuff coming. And we're going to have an update for that draft war room book as well. We're just waiting for the Steelers visits to kind of just pan out here. They have over 20 visits. Uh, the official number was up to like 23, I think. But several of those are considered local visits, so they don't technically count. And I guess West Virginia is lumped in with Pittsburgh, so they have like four or five players. Uh, so they still haven't used all of their 30. As soon as we get the final tally on the 30, uh, there are about six players currently who aren't even profiled in this war room. This is how volatile and how quick it changes even before anybody gets drafted. You have players just their stock shooting up, guys that's shooting down, guys are coming out of nowhere. And we have a few of those that, to add to this. So not to make us look stupid, nobody else knew who these guys were either. Some of them weren't even at the Combine. They hadn't been seen before. And all of a sudden, boom, pre-draft visitor with the Pittsburgh Steelers. Pretty cool stuff. It's going to be fun to watch coming in the next week and a half. So, folks, I'm going to leave you off with that. I'm going to tell you, quarterback, 
hey, it wouldn't make me upset. Just don't have too high of expectations. I hope this is the last you hear of this from me. I really want an edge rusher. I really want a corner. And you know what? There's some crazies out there who think wide receiver, tight end, or running back could be in play too. Oh, we're going to be talking about that soon. Because guess what? There's Fitzgerald Toussaint and Niall Davis behind Lev Bell, who's only under a one-year franchise tag. So they're going to need some help there too. But we'll talk about that next time. Until then, be safe, be good, and I'll catch you later. We would like to thank you for listening and remind our listeners to follow us on social media and our website, www.steelcityunderground.com. 